right now or does it during Super Duper Sunday like Carmen and Stefan are doing this morning. All of us who do that at any time ought to be sobered when we read James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should be teachers. And those of you who don't have some kind of a specific teaching role on an ongoing basis, I think you'll see there's still an application from these verses for you as well. Apparently, in the church in 48 AD, there were a lot of people who wanted to be the pastor. A lot of people who wanted to teach. When they got together, apparently there were a whole group of folks who were trying to work out who was going to get to teach this morning because there was more supply than there was demand. Now, do you think that we've got the same problem in our day? Do you think there are more people who aspire to teach than who ought to be teaching? Well, in some ways, I would say we need more teachers. In other ways, I would say, yeah, we've got people aspiring to teach who, who ought not be teaching. So we need to heed these verses to understand how this applies in our day. Chapman University in Orange, California does a survey regularly where they surveyed the top fears of people in America. The top fears. You, they asked 1,500 people, and uh, these are the top seven fears. Fear number seven is the fear of flying. About 14% of people don't want to get on an airplane. I, I just, I got to ask, anybody in here? Fear of flying? Okay, got a, we got some fear of flying. That's about 14%, all right. 18% claustrophobia is their fear. We've got some hands for claustrophobia. Yeah. The MRI is just a terrible thing, isn't it? Here they, yeah, it's your, ew. Okay. Uh, about the same number, about 18% have a fear of blood and needles. 19%, <clears throat> excuse me, have a fear of drowning. Yeah, <laughs> some hands go up for that, yeah. 22%, a fear of bugs and uh, snakes and other animals. Oh, yes. <clears throat> got, a, got a revival starting with that one. Okay. 24%, a fear of heights. Who's got the, I don't like heights either. What's the number one fear, you know? Yeah, there it is, number one. According to Chapman, 25% of us have a fear of public speaking. I have no comprehension of that at all. <laughs> Sorry, I I cannot understand that. It's it, when I I see a microphone, it's like a magnet. I'm just drawn to it. Okay, but apparently for some of you, that's not the case. Fear of speaking. Now I don't know if the fear of public speaking was at the top of anybody's list 2,000 years ago. I don't know if the fears then are the same. I guess fear of flying. Nobody had the fear of flying back then, but. Apparently, there were a lot of people who didn't have that fear and who wanted to be the teacher. So the question is, why would some of these people aspire? Why would they want the position of being a teacher? And the reason is because we respect and admire and look up to our teachers. Some of you, if I were to ask you about a, an elementary or a junior high or a high school teacher you had, you could name a name right now of somebody who marked you significantly, somebody who really spoke into your life, somebody you respected, somebody you were admired, somebody you wanted to be like. That's, that's how we are toward teachers. We, we respect them. We admire them. In James' day, if somebody had the title rabbi, which means teacher, there was honor that came with that title. In fact, it's interesting, in the Old Testament law, it said that if your father and the rabbi were both in trouble, you took care of the rabbi first. There was honor associated with that. According to Strong's Concordance, a rabbi was a teacher-scholar recognized by the Jewish people for accumulating a great number of Bible facts and respected for his accumulation of knowledge. Rab, that, that just word rab on rabbi, means great. So literally, rabbi meant my great one or my honorable sir. Now, if that's how people are going to think of you, there were folks who went, I'd, I'd like that title. I'd like that office. I'd like that position. Remember the rabbi and fiddler on the roof? Remember at the very beginning of that when Tevye is talking about everybody? He says, in our little village. I mean, this is my chance to do my one little Tevye. 
I've always wanted to play Tevye. In my little village, he said, we always had our special types. For instance, Yenta, the matchmaker, Reb Nickum, the beggar, and most important of all, our beloved rabbi. Rabbi, can we ask you a question? Certainly, Levish. Is there a proper blessing for the czar? You know this, right? A blessing for the czar, of course. May God bless and keep the czar. Far, far away from us, right? You remember that? <laughs> so the honor in the city, everybody, whenever there is a question, a thorny issue, you go to the rabbi, and whatever the rabbi says, he's the teacher. He has the honor. He has the esteem. So in Jesus' day, people wanted to be teachers because they wanted the honor and the reverence and the esteem. And honestly, in our day, there can be the same fleshly motivation for honor and esteem mixed with whatever noble or godly motivation any teacher might have. The Puritan Thomas Manton said about this desire for prestige and power and authority that comes with teaching, he said, it's an attractive evil. It suits pride and self-love and feeds conceit. Manton said, these evils are in the best of God's children wish I could tell you that I'm standing here this morning, there is no hint of any desire for any of this esteem or pride in my own heart. That I have a pure motive, that I, I'm not up here because I want you to like or admire or respect me. I'm just up here to be a transparent vessel through whom the word of God comes. I wish I could tell you that's my sole motivation. That I just, any, any credit that I would get for this, I would just want it to all go to God. I wish I could say that, but I know my own heart better. Every week, I have to beat back the impulse of the flesh in doing this. I have to remind myself that God can speak more clearly and more effectively through rocks and stones and donkeys than he does through me. He doesn't need me, just as Matt was saying. In the end, the more I can be transparent, not about who I am, but so you don't see me and see him, that's the only way I can be effective. So the first reason that many ought not be teachers, whether it's in James' day or in our day, is because of wrong motives. Some people want to be teachers because they have the wrong motives. In 2011, Anthony Tomasini, who is the classical music critic for the New York Times, wrote a series of articles for his newspaper where he decided he would give the ranking of the top 10 classical composers of all time. Now, it was one man's opinion. It was not a survey. It was not a poll. It was just his opinion of who were the top 10. And by the way, his list did not include Haydn or Handel or Chopin. You want to know who he was on the list? In reverse order. Number 10, Bartok. Number 9, Wagner. Number 8, Verdi. Number 7, Brahms. Number 6, Stravinsky. Number 5, Debussy. Number or Debussy. Which one did you say? Debussy or Debussy? Debussy. No, it's Debussy. You're wrong. Uh, <laughs> number 4, Schubert. Number 3, Mozart. Who's number 2? Beethoven. Who's number one? Bach. 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 I, I shouldn't do this, but there was a... There's a <laughs> so the story is told that they were going to make a movie about classical composers, and they went to the actors in Hollywood, and they said to them, who do you want to play? And Stallone said, I'll be Beethoven. And, and uh, Chuck Norris said, I'll be Mozart. And uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger said, I'll be Bach. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so this list, this list is just one man's opinion, but I think most of us would agree that Johann Sebastian Bach, if he's not number one, he's certainly top three, at least top five, right? I mean, Bach is up there with everybody. Did you know that if you pulled out a manuscript from Bach, at the top of that manuscript, you would find the letters in his hand, J.J. Did you know that? Can we put up a manuscript? 
Here's a Bach manuscript. Have you got one? You don't have something? There's not a picture there? Yes. This is a Bach manuscript. You see up in the upper left-hand corner? Zoom in on that. Can you zoom in on that? No, you, you can. <laughs> Trust me. Go to the next. Oh, there you see. That, that next one says JJ. Uh, it, it, poor penmanship, but that's what JJ. Okay. Do you know what JJ stands for? Anybody? JJ stands for Yesu Yuva, the Latin, which means help me, Jesus. Before Bach sat down to write any piece of music, he took a blank sheet of paper and he wrote, J.J., help me, Jesus. Didn't end there, though. At the end of every piece of music, Bach wrote three other initials. Actually, sometimes he wrote out the words. In the bottom right-hand corner, zoom in on that. Soli Deo Gloria. That's the Latin for only God gets glory. Help me, Jesus, only God gets glory. S-D-G. <clears throat> I, I have, uh, on occasion, been asked to sign copies of the one book that I've written. And whenever I've been asked to do that, I write before my name, Soli Deo Gloria. To remind, not so much the reader, but to remind the writer that only God gets glory. Because somebody says, would you sign my book? That can go right to the proud heart, right? So it's just a good reminder to me. Look, don't, don't think you're all that and a bag of chips, okay? That ought to be on the heart of every teacher before he or she teaches, help me, Jesus, only God gets glory. I can do nothing apart from Jesus when I'm done I only want Jesus to be glorified in this. One of the reasons that only a few should be teachers is because if you step into that role, you step into an ongoing battle with pride in your life that will cause you to have to be on the alert all the time. So do I have the right motives doing what I'm doing here this morning? Well, I trust that by God's grace I do. And I know that hiding right behind the right motives, right there in the bushes, are all of the wrong motives waiting for any opportunity to attack. Just beneath the surface in my heart, I'm doing my best to be on guard against those temptations. There's another reason why not many should be teachers. It's because some people just don't know what they're talking about. They shouldn't be teachers because they got the wrong information. Have you ever asked somebody for directions only to find out they didn't have a clue? Like Google Maps, for example? <laughs> I mean, not many should be teachers because some people haven't done the work to get the answer to be the teacher. If I were to stop and ask you where you learned about marital intimacy for the first time, most people I've asked this question would tell me that they learned it from a peer. Can I suggest to you that another 12-year-old is not probably the person who ought to be teaching you about human reproduction, right? Because they don't know any better than you know. They ought not be teachers. And in our day, I think we've got people who are aspiring to the position of teacher, but they, they aren't doing the diligent work necessary to learn what they ought to learn before they teach. In fact, what they're often doing is just giving opinions on what God's Word says rather than studying hard, doing what Paul calls Timothy to do, which is to be diligent in rightly dividing the truth. To, to attempt to teach without having first done the studying and the meditating and the praying and the digging into the text. That's a dangerous thing, and you ought not do that. When Mary Ann and I were first married, I told her that I wanted to have a Bible study in our home. I wanted to be a teacher, okay? And so we agreed that we would have a Bible study in our home, and here's how I would prepare for the Bible study. I would get a cassette from John MacArthur, and I would listen to it, and then when we had our Bible study, I would just say as much as I could remember from the cassette that I'd listened to, and that's how I became a teacher. Now, the good news is there were really only two people who were showing up for the Bible study. 
<laughs> one was Mary Ann and another was my friend Larry Sloan. And they would come, Larry would come over every week and we would have our Bible study. There was at least one occasion where I was teaching where Mary Ann didn't like what I was saying, so she left the room. It was just Larry and me, okay? So I would tell you that I had the desire to be a teacher, but in those days I had no business being a teacher because to take on the responsibility to be a teacher means to take on the responsibility to, to seek to know the mind of God as revealed in the word of God. I remember one Bible study I was doing with students at Christmas time. And, and by the way, just so you know, this was a study I was leading before I had been converted, okay? And that's a whole other story that I can explain to you sometime, but I was involved in, in doing ministry to high school students for a couple years before I came to faith. So one time I was in a Bible study and we were talking about the virgin birth. And I said, you know, it doesn't matter whether Mary really was a virgin. It just matters that God could do that. I, I cringe at the fact that I actually said that to high school students years ago. Because what I was saying is, it doesn't matter what God's word says. That's, that's terrifying. There is a stricter judgment, the Bible says, James says, for those who say stupid things like that. So, again, am I confident that what I'm teaching you here this morning is a correct understanding of what James says in James 3, 1 and 2? Is there any part of this sermon that I'm giving here that God would be listening to and go, no, 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 son, son, don't say that. No, no, that's wrong. Well, I, to, to the best I know, what I'm doing is accurate. But I recognize that I'm not infallible in that regard. R.C. Sproul was asked one time, do you think everything you teach is right? He said, I think about 85% of what I teach is right. He said, I don't know which 15% is wrong. If I knew it was wrong, I'd change it. But to the best of my knowledge, this is what I understand. I'm sure I'm going to get to heaven, and I'm going to find out that my understanding of this passage was wrong. My understanding of this concept was wrong. But to the best of my knowledge, with the study I've done, the prayer, the meditation... What James is trying to say in James 3, 1 and 2, I'm trying to represent it the best way I know how. I, I preached my first sermon 38 years ago. I was 20, I don't know, how, how old would that be? I was 20-something. Yeah, it was the second year of the Carter administration, and our church at that time was meeting. We were listening to audio cassettes. We didn't have a preacher. And one of the guys said to me, why don't you preach next week? And I said, I'd love to. <laughs> you see a systemic problem here, don't you? Would you, would you like to hear just a brief audio sample? Yeah. Can we play just, this will just, just about 35 seconds. Here I am in 1978. The kind of a lifestyle that God asks for. Now the meaning of the word blessed or blessed, as it's found in most of the older translations, many of the newer translations, I say here the, the, Today's English version, which is the Good News Bible, instead of saying blessed, we'll say happy. Happy is, you know, he who mourns. And the Living Bible calls the believer fortunate. He says, uh, you are fortunate if you do this, for God will do this. Okay, that's, that's quite uh, enough of that, all right? It's from the Beatitudes. I have no idea who that person is there. Um, I, I would tell you that uh, I have listened to that sermon and I disagree with most of the conclusions I preached 38 years ago. I, I had found a commentary that they were saying, here's how the, what the Beatitudes mean, and I thought, okay, that's what it means. I just wrote out my notes and basically regurgitated the commentary for the congregation. I would look at that commentary today and I would say, yeah, I, I think they start with a flawed premise. It you know what, you ought not to teach like I was teaching 38 years ago or longer than that without doing the study, without doing, having the prayer, without the meditation, motivated more by the prestige that comes than by a desire to see God glorified. Now, it's possible I'll come back to you at some point 10 years from now and say, you remember that sermon on James 3? Well, I got it all wrong. I, it's possible. I don't think so, but... If, if that's the case, I'll tell you. Paul says that 
when we read the scriptures today or when we seek to understand God today, we see in a mirror what? Dimly. We just got to be honest. It, it's a blurred vision that we have. But that doesn't excuse us from the responsibility as teachers to study, to pray, to meditate, and to ask God by his spirit to direct us. Let me just say, it is more than just doing the right study. I, I believe that before somebody ought to stand up and preach on a passage, if that passage has not had an impact in that person's own soul, then he probably or she probably should not be getting up and talking about it. Amen. Uh, th there, are, there are folks who suggest, and I, I would agree with this, they would suggest when you're doing your, your Bible reading throughout the week, if you're a teacher, they would say you shouldn't just limit yourself to the passage you're going to be teaching. You should be reading more broadly, and I agree with that. But I also think there's a tendency on the part of some to approach a passage academically and not to approach a passage transformationally. And so when I read James 3, 1 and 2, the first person I am most interested in this having an impact on is me. And if it hasn't had an impact in my soul, then I hesitate to get up here and say something to you about the impact it ought to have in your soul. Here's a final reason why I think people ought not be teaching ought to be teachers because their lives don't match up with what they're teaching. They say one thing and they do another. That's called being a hypocrite in the Bible. To a certain extent, that is always true about the teacher, right? I always teach better than I live. You can ask Marianne about that. I've only written one book, but I picked a doozy of a subject to write on. It's called The Christian Husband. Don't you want to be the guy who wrote The Christian Husband, right? <laughs> Your wife can always say, didn't you write that book called The Christian Husband? Which Marianne never does because she has more control over her tongue. She may think it, but she doesn't say it. The Apostle Paul in his magnum opus, the book of Romans, says, there are things I hate I end up doing. Every teacher is a flawed vessel. We are not perfect. But the person who teaches ought to be somebody who is not saying one thing with his lips and then regularly doing something completely different with his life. Because when that hypocrisy winds up being exposed, as it often is, it does more damage to the cause of Christ than the blessing from his teaching ever did. We've seen that happen too many times in the lives of high-profile preachers who wound up being exposed and what stays with us today is not the good ministry they did, but the reality of their hypocrisy. There are many who ought not be preaching because their lives don't match. Remember what Jesus quoted as a proverb in Luke chapter 4 when he said, Physician, heal thyself. If somebody is teaching today that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and yet that person is a greedy materialist, he ought not be teaching. If somebody's teaching today that it's wrong to look on a woman with lust and then he's going home and looking at that, he ought not be teaching. If somebody is teaching that one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control and yet there is some area in his own life where he does not have control, he ought not be teaching. If someone is teaching that a godly person can control his or her tongue and then he can't or she can't, they're going and lying and gossiping, they ought not be teaching. Now before you say, hey, nobody's teaching, if that's true, then nobody should teach. You're right. It's not that you have to be perfect, but the Bible says the standard is an above reproach standard. It's where somebody can't say, this is characterologically true about you on an ongoing basis, and therefore you're disqualified from teaching. I, I am, among you as a teacher this morning, a sinner who is not perfect in the ways that I just described to you. But I would also say to you that the things I just described to you I don't think are characterologically true about me. Do, do I, am I tempted by greed and materialism? Sure. Do I think that dominates my life? I don't think so. Am I tempted by lust? Absolutely. Does that dominate my life? No. By the grace of God, it doesn't. You see, that's the difference. It's not are you tempted and do you slip. It's a question of is this true uh, dominant part of your life? And if it is, before you teach, you need to be holy. You need to be doing battle with these things. You need to be having some victory in these areas. 
So the first sin of the tongue that James addresses is the sin of misrepresenting God and his word with what you teach by your impure motives or by incorrect information or by misrepresenting Christ in how you live your life. And that's the reason that those who teach will endure a stricter judgment. When we misrepresent Jesus to others, we can cause others to stumble spiritually. And Jesus said, it would be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and be thrown into the ocean than to cause somebody to stumble spiritually. So many of us hear a message like this this morning and we think, okay, I'm convinced. I never really wanted to teach anyway. Now I don't want to, really. Now, now you've really scared me off of this teaching. Well, here's the problem with that. The problem is the Great Commission. Go ye therefore into all the world preaching the gospel, baptizing believers, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Huh. Who's that for? Well, that's for everybody. So everybody's called to teach. It may be that you're teaching your children. It may be that you're teaching a neighborhood Bible study. It may be that you're teaching in, in some small group setting, but we're all called to teach. It may be a one-on-one -on -one lunch where you're just sharing the things of God with a coworker. And that's, that's not a responsibility, just a responsibility that you're given. It's a privilege. In fact, if your life has been transformed by the grace of God, there should be an outflow of your life that is talking about the things of God to others. You should be excited about that. You go see a movie, you thought it was a good movie, you can't shut up about it. Did you see the movie? It's really a great movie. You go and have a life-changing encounter with Jesus and then you want to not talk to anybody about it? Everybody's called to teach. We're all called to evangelize and disciple others. In fact, when we really get our hearts around what Jesus has done for us in his death and resurrection, it, it ought to be on our lips. And so we ought to be examining our own hearts and lives for the motives in all that we do. We ought to be putting to death impure motives. We ought to be, we ought to be dying to selfish desires, living for one purpose, which is that God alone would get glory. I didn't ask him if I could share this illustration, but I hope he doesn't mind. I went a year ago to Jeff Quo, and I said, I'd like to have you I'd like to have you preach for us. And Jeff gave the exact right response. He said, no. <laughs> I remember. Uh, this was not false modesty or humility on Jeff's part. This was Jeff having a sober understanding of James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should be teachers. He felt disqualified. He felt like not, not disqualified because of these things I've talked about, but just he was aware of the sober responsibility that go, comes with teaching, which was one of the ways I knew Jeff was ready to teach because he understood that. And you remember, if you were here last summer when he preached, that he did a great job. I'm sobered by the fact that as a teacher, I face a stricter judgment. But I am also liberated by the fact that what I don't face is the condemnation of God even when I mess up. Because the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the good news is I face a stricter judgment. I'm accountable to God for that. But that judgment never ends in condemnation. It ends in healing grace. Correcting, loving, disciplining grace for my many transgressions. That's the only reason that you can come to James 3, 1. Not many of you should teach because there's a stricter judgment and say, Lord, who can stand? And the answer is anybody who walks by faith. Anybody who trusts in God. God gives the strength. Because of what is pictured for us on this table behind me, I can come and teach the word because the Lord gave his life because he suffered the pain for my sin I can come and without fear, without dread know that an imperfect man can do what God has called him to do 
without fear, knowing I'll mess up, but being sobered by the responsibility and trying to shoulder it the best way I can. And I hope that's true for all of you in whatever teaching role you're in. If you're a daddy, if you're a co-worker, wherever you're sharing, a small group leader, whatever you're doing, I hope you will say this responsibility is an important one and I want to do it rightly before the Lord and then execute that. We're going to come to the table this morning, which, as I wrote about this week, is a table of grace. It's a table that's a family meal. It, it's the table where we come to receive and be reminded of God's good grace and be strengthened by his grace as we come and receive these elements. Jesus said, as often as you do this, you come to remember me and remember my death and resurrection. And so if you're here this morning with us as a visitor, we want you to know that all who love and have surrendered their lives to Christ are welcome at this table to receive the bread and the wine. If you're here this morning and you, you've examined your own faith and you've said, you know, I think instead of a real faith, what I have is a false faith or no faith at all, then rather than coming and receiving, I just encourage you to stop and consider what you've heard this morning and think about what God's word is saying to you in this place. We're going to uh, take communion by coming down the outer aisles to receive the elements. You'll go back to your seats through the center aisle and hold on to the elements. We'll take them together here in just a few minutes. You take a few minutes to uh, consider these things and prepare your hearts while I prepare the table.
Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples on the night before he was crucified. In the middle of that meal, he took bread, and after he had prayed a prayer of blessing, he tore the bread and he passed it. He said, this bread is my body broken for you. As often as you receive this, he said, remember me. Lord Jesus, this morning, that's what we do. We remember that our only hope of life, of service, our only hope of joy and purpose and peace is found in you. Thank you that you made a new and living way to God through your death on the cross and that because of what you accomplished, we can come to live with him, to know him, and to be adopted into the family of God. We receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. In the same way, after the meal was completed, Jesus took the cup, he prayed a prayer of blessing, then he passed it, and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, the new promise, the new testament that God is making. It's the covenant of my blood shed for the remission of your sins. The writer of Hebrews said, it is not the blood of bulls and goats that atones for sin, but the once for all sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so, Lord Jesus, as we come to remember your death and your shed blood this morning, we again are grateful that our sin is under that blood and that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Now, if you would stand, we're going to sing just that chorus of you are stronger, you are stronger, and uh, then I'll close us with a benediction. So, Kendall. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you our Lord of all, you are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. And now receive this as a blessing from God, a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Go in Christ in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you back here tonight at 645 for ice cream and uh, have a great day. Thank you.